legal personality hurdles to remain in place. These are difficult but negotiable. I think we'll have uh, visa difficulties moderating. General understanding uh, will improve over time, especially to the work of Cole and his people. One thing we, I expect we'll see and we're seeing now more and more is the increased use of religion as a wedge issue by politicians. This is especially the case in Malaysia and in Indonesia. Perversely, when you have increased political pluralism, uh, they seem to be using religion as a way to pull people one direction or another. I think we'll see increased government failures to protect religious liberties. Pakistan's a poster child for that. And, uh, and facility zoning and permitting is a very difficult issue. Um, if the neighborhood objects, even though you have a lawful meeting place going on there, they'll pull the permits. Um, and that's where we are. While I'm pulling up, pulling up my presentation, um, some of you are old enough to remember that uh, it used to be uh, in the Olympics before the digital age, the judges would stand or sit and after a performance they would hold up a card. It would say 10 or 9 or whatever. And, I became alarmed when the young lady down here on Rick's presentation held up a five. <laughs> and, uh, and then a one. And then it went to one. Uh, so uh, anyway, I'm, I'm grateful to uh, spend a few minutes with you and grateful to be associated with these uh, brethren with the Office of General Counsel. Uh, the area that I've been associated with over the past couple of years has been the Europe East area, among other areas. And uh, uh, the person who I think ought to be giving this presentation is actually uh, somewhere in, his, in uh, Uzbekistan at the moment. So uh, you're kind of getting the uh, second team here, at least I hope it's the second team. Uh, I want to show you a map of the Europe East area, and uh, I put three stars here. Uh, uh, they are indicative of where the church uh, has stakes. There are two stakes in, uh, in uh, Russia, one stake in Ukraine, and one stake in Armenia, which, uh, uh, again, the area is so small you can't, you can't get the name and the area together there, the country. But uh, those are the four stakes in Eastern Europe. When we think of Eastern Europe, or at least when I think of Eastern Europe, I kind of tend to put it into five buckets. I look at the Baltic nations, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and there we have congregations. And I would say that uh, more or less, uh, about a thousand members more or less in each of those, each of those countries. Uh, the second bucket is typically what I would <clears throat> refer to as the, uh, the lands of the, or the lands or the, the people of the Rus, uh, Belarus, uh, the Kievan Rus, uh, Ukraine, the, uh, the Russian people kind of the heartland of the Eastern Slavic uh, uh, people. The third area, or the third bucket, is really along the, the uh, Caucasus Mountains, the, those three countries there, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, which really are right along the edge of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Europe and uh, Asia, meeting there in that mountain range. Azerbaijan, we have no formal presence there. Uh, the fourth bucket, uh, really, I would uh, tend to think of as these uh, former uh, republics of the, uh, of the USSR, the Soviet stands, Kazakhstan, where we have two congregations. We have a congregation in, in Astana and uh, Almaty. And then you, you have the others where we do not have a formal presence. Now, not having a formal presence doesn't mean that we're never there. Uh, we, we may carry out humanitarian activities uh, now and then again, uh, and uh, there may be some uh, a handful of expats, but but by and large, no no uh, formal uh, church presence in um, in the uh, Soviet stands, uh, save for uh, Kazakhstan at the moment. And then you move over to the fifth bucket, the remnant or the the um, uh, what the the former Ottoman Empire. Uh, Turkey and, and across the uh, 
uh, straight there into Bulgaria. So uh, that's kind of an overview of the Europe East area and, and so I want to hit some of the uh, what I see uh, observations with respect to uh, excuse me with respect to uh, religious liberty in the Europe East area. Uh, someone has once said they like uh, the word observations. You, uh, you can use it because you have nothing to prove and you don't need support for anything that you say. So I'm, I'm going to set out though a few things, uh, at least my observations over the past couple of years. I've put the... Uh, uh, I, each of these countries are very different. I'm just using these three as examples. Russia, Turkey, Armenia. They, they have very different uh, characteristics, but when it comes to protection of uh, religious freedoms, uh, Russia, Turkey, the, on paper they're decent. Armenia is actually quite fulsome. Uh, it's not an issue in the Europe East area of having countries with uh, constitutions that don't have religious, free, excuse me, religious freedom protections. Uh, they do. They they all do. Actually, I can't think of a single one that doesn't have a, a decent. Uh, constitutional protection that is um, uh, written in as a key provision of their constitution. But that's really not the issue and I think uh, Rick uh, touched on some of these in his area, in the Asia area, that um, even though you have something on paper, the reality actually is much different uh, at times. Uh, not all the time, but uh, quite often. The geographical and social challenges, uh, uh, by the way, at this point my presentation is a five. I just got the word. So uh, just the vastness of Russia, it, it really is a, a big place. And, and that does affect uh, constitutional protections uh, with respect to religious liberty. There's considerable discretion that is used or uh, that is exercised by, by law enforcement officials. Some, some of them are not literate. They, they don't know the law. They're a long way from Moscow. Um, and so you just have a, um, a real disparate uh, enforcement understanding of religious liberties. There are conservative areas, not unlike the U.S. We, we sometimes speak of the south or the southern part of the United States as being a Bible belt or as being very conservative. Russia is the very same. It, it has its areas that are very conservative as well. So you do get different interpretations and different enforcements. Um, since I only have five minutes, I'm going to really speed this up. But uh, promulgation of federal laws that are vaguely worded. Uh, this is the one I like. Uh, for example, insulting the Turkish nation. It is a criminal offense. Now you might understand exactly what that phrase means. That phrase was meant uh, to clarify the way the law used to read. The law used to read insulting Turkishness. So if you can, if the first rendition gave you a problem, the second one will clarify it for you. Um, <laughs> There are a lot of vaguely worded federal laws, and uh, I'm going to skip over some of these. A number of the countries have laws on uh, laws against uh, extremism. Uh, Russia certainly does. Kazakhstan does. Uh, Georgia, last I knew, did, uh, or I can't remember if it was proposed or actually signed into law. But what constitutes extremism uh, is certainly subject to participation. Excuse me, interpretation. Uh, Materials themselves can, are subject to this law. So, uh, for example, Jehovah Witnesses have run into this with their materials being uh, deemed to be extremist. And once something is deemed to be extremist, then you, you find that its importation is, is prohibited, its possession is prohibited, its distribution is prohibited, its printing is prohibited. You can imagine what would happen to, within, uh, within our view, the LDS Church, if the Book of Mormon were deemed to be extremist literature. And uh, we have dealt with that issue in Russia, and we have opinions that it is not extremist in literature. We've had challenges, um, so, uh, and we've overcome those uh, to date, and so that's uh, very significant. But, but what the Constitution gives, federal law at times takes away. Uh, we, have con there, we deal with nations that do have concerns over national security, and Rick's point on, on young volunteers coming in, uh, when they're at the border and they say they're a minister and somebody asks them, do you have any religious training? And the answer is, well, not much. Do you have a college degree? Do you have a divinity degree? Do you have any degree, by the way? And the, and the young man says, no, I'm 18. Well, that doesn't look like a minister. In fact, 
uh, to, to a lot of the world, that, that, that type of person. So there are concerns over national security, and we do see a tightening with uh, immigration laws that restrict not only entrance, but how long one can stay in a country. Uh, and I think we're going to see a lot more of it. Uh, passage of broadly worded laws that potentially affect legitimate religious minorities. Um, in a couple of months ago, President Putin signed into law in Russia uh, a, a uh, law that allows the government to identify and ban undesirable foreign organizations, including religious uh, organizations. And how this is going to be interpreted uh, in the future is, really remains to be seen. Rick touched on nationalism, that it, what it really means, and this creates a chill on, on people being, it undermines people's willingness to exercise religious freedoms um, and to achieve the benefit of those freedoms, that you can't be uh, a citizen of X unless you are also a citizen of, uh, excuse me, a believer in faith X. Uh, protectionist laws, outright prohibitions with criminal sanctions on proselyting or as it translates in some, uh, some languages, soul hunting. Um, owner's registration of missionaries, outright restrictions on movement. Um, bright spots, there are a few, I think. The Baltic nations, the Ukraine, or excuse me, Ukraine, uh, has been uh, successful. And I'll skip over some of these. Current unknowns, uh, the effect of the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, Eurasian Economic Space, as uh, really the laws of member countries seem to tend to creep toward one another as they join together economically. And, and we may yet see that with those uh, countries that do join in Russia with this uh, Eurasian Economic Union. The conflict between Russia and Ukraine, uh, how that will play out, and Crimea. By the way, we are now registered there. Our local religious organizations are registered. We've had to switch from Ukraine to Russia. I don't have time to go into the, the fine line of trying to operate in one country not look as though you're supporting one side versus uh, the other side saying, well, you're supporting them. Uh, the, the opportunity to misstep is great um, and, and very challenging. Um, I think I will end with that. Um, some of you are aware of the announcement of the Central Eurasian Mission to be headquartered in Istanbul, Turkey. I uh, have a few slides on that, and I may be able to answer a question or two on that later. But thank you very much. It's wonderful to be with you. My name is Mike Jensen. Uh, my area is the Europe area. And like my brethren, my assignment is to quickly identify some legal issues which potentially affect religious liberty in that area where I work. Last month, the International Center for Law and Religion Studies co-sponsored a conference at Oxford University. It was in honor of the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta. Uh, Magna Carta was signed at Runnymede by King John, um, a principal author, was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and among other things, one of the intended purposes of Magna Carta was to reserve the independence of the church from the crown. Now, hundreds and hundreds of years later, Europe is in a very interesting um, position. It's experiencing uh, several e kinds of events that have potential impact on religious freedom. First and foremost is immigration. Waves and waves of immigration. Uh, mostly low-income groups. Many are Muslim. Uh, they come, of course, to Europe for increased opportunity. You read in the newspaper the struggles the governments uh, are having uh, on the one side with the, the adverse media <laughs> publicity they're getting with boatloads of people approaching European shores, capsizing boats, um, uh, injury and death on that side. And on the other side, trying to come to terms with how economically they can accommodate this influx. Uh, second, of course, economic and political <coughs> challenges. We're reading 
nearly every day still about the EU, Greece, brinksmanship. Um, we hear about the UK, Prime Minister Cameron proposing to hold a referendum as early as next year on whether the UK should remain in the EU unless it gets a better deal uh, for Britons. So uh, those uh, issues can uh, present situations that may impact on religious freedom. Uh, a related <clears throat> issue deals with the increase in the Muslim population in Europe. This is due to immigration, conversion, and birth rates. Birth rates of Muslim women um, is double that of uh, other women in Europe. So in 1990, there were about 30 million Muslims in Europe. By 2010, there were 44 million Muslims. The expectation is by the year 2050 that 10% of European, uh, of the European populace will be Muslim. Um, related to that, uh, European countries are increasingly concerned with recruits drawn from Europe to the Islamic State. This has shocked and alarmed uh, governments, including the governments of, uh, of Austria, Germany, and France. And if we have time, I may comment on some uh, trends regarding redefining the traditional family, which may, even though we're in Europe and under a little bit of a different model, like Brett Scharf's referred to in the last session, uh, can have impact on religious liberty. So uh, impact number one, I call it uh, having to do with the control of borders. A couple of quick examples. Austria, uh, some months ago, enacted legislation prohibiting foreign funding for Muslim organizations in the country. Now just think of that from a, an LDS uh, perspective. There are not that many countries that are independent, uh, there are not that many countries in which the church has a presence that is financially independent of the Wasatch Front Idaho, Southern California, and Arizona for contributions that go. Uh, the church participated with other faith groups in objecting to that, um, unfortunately without effect. Switzerland, visas, it's been quite a number of years since non-EU nationals were allowed into the country on a religion visa. This is not because uh, Switzerland has a problem with Mormons or any other kind of religion, but they do, they don't say it publicly, but they do have concern about issues of reciprocity if they allow LDS missionaries in and other religious figures in. They need to allow Islamic um, faith leaders into the country uh, and there is concern about extremism. The UK is cracking down on its borders. It's in instituted a recent change requiring a biometric card for every foreign national to carry. Uh, it is requiring landlords to check independently the visa and registration status of foreign nationals before landlords will sign a contract with them. Now, as far as the church is concerned, we can deal with those. It makes it inconvenient, uh, but we're not being singled out. It's simply a sign uh, of the times. A few other quick issues. So Switzerland, also in the news in this, uh, in this setting, uh, not too long ago held a referendum uh, about minarets banning them specifically, and 57 plus percent of the populace uh, voted in favor of that. The church has had uh, some challenges in Europe uh, regarding religious property zoning requests, meeting house construction uh, permits. That's similar in other areas. Uh, other uh, religions have had legislation or proposed legislation um, uh, brought forward that would Im adversely impact them, such as the proposed ban on circumcision. We've seen some uh, interplay of freedoms or lack of freedoms for 
public ex or for personal expression in the workplace. Let me just mention a couple of things now since uh, uh, some of the conference here obviously has centered on the U.S. Supreme Court decision recently on same-sex marriage issues in Europe. Uh, the first country to approve same-sex marriage in Europe was the Netherlands in the year 2000. Since then, all of the Scandinavian countries have enacted similar legislation and following thereon the following countries, Belgium, Luxembourg, France, Spain, Portugal, the UK, and perhaps most remarkably and most recently just in May, Ireland, which was quite a shock to the Catholic Church in that country. Now so far, the Church has not experienced any problems with claims of uh, discrimination for failure to perform uh, same gender marriages or failing to provide its meeting houses for same sex marriages. But we're watching that because in the UK, for example, church meeting houses are registered with the government. You have to if you're going to perform civil marriages by your priesthood leaders in our case. So we're monitoring that. In Spain, recent legislation has given the church the right to do uh, civil marriages and we're going to be in the process of certificating our priesthood leaders so that they can do that. But uh, we're cautious there about the impact of possibly being asked by others uh, outside of our faith to perform uh, same uh, gender marriages or to use our meeting houses. So. Uh, uh, thankfully, it hasn't been much of an issue yet, but we're, uh, we're monitoring. The European Parliament, interestingly enough, has proposed legislation uh, or <laughs> guidelines for its member states uh, to enact uh, legislation for same-sex marriage. This is a little unusual uh, because of the, and, and possibly beyond the mandate of, uh, of the European Parliament. A couple of good news uh, pieces to end with. The European Union has adopted guidelines on freedom of religion, freedom of expression. The new EU Office of the Church participated in commenting on the last uh, proposed guidelines. And those guidelines are uh, really quite excellent and hopefully will be used by the European Union to encourage member states and even beyond the borders of the European Union uh, to protect religious freedom ideals. Thank you. My name is uh, Lee Wright with the law firm of Curtin McConkie, um, the Office of General Counsel and uh, Brother Bill Atkin have given me the opportunity over the last several years to assist in uh, the Middle East, Africa, North area and the topic I have today is the Islamic world. Um, as it is Ramadan, uh, which is the month of fast, uh, typically a greeting would be Ramadan Mubarak for those who are uh, fasting and to uh, show respect to them. Um, and so I greet you with Ram Ramadan Mubarak. There are many similarities in our faith traditions that I would like to share. I read something recently that said, the bad breath of one who is fasting is more beautiful to Allah than the sweetest perfume. Um, and I, I relate to that in our own tradition of, of fasting. As noted uh, in an article by Jim Toronto in the, in the Enzyme, uh, elders George A. Smith and Parley P. Pratt of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in 1850 delivered lengthy sermons demonstrating an accurate and balanced understanding of Islamic history and speaking highly of Muhammad's leadership. Um, Elder Smith observed that Muhammad was descended from Abraham and was no doubt raised up by God on purpose to preach against idolatry. 
Um, speaking next, Elder Pratt went on to express his admiration for Muhammad's teachings, asserting that upon the whole, Muslims have better morals than many Christian nations. Um, so understanding our similarities and even referencing uh, Elder Perry's most recent general conference talk where a, a Muslim Iranian scholar from the colloquium quoted the proclamation on the family. I think it's appropriate that we recognize the positives and recognize the similarities between our traditions. Now the Islamic world uh, and legal issues affecting it uh, begs the question, what is the Islamic world? As uh, Rick Page has, has noted, uh, clearly it includes a, a majority of Muslim states in the Middle East and in North Africa, but based on immigration, birth, and conversion rates, um, it's expanding, as uh, Mike Jensen has also noted. Uh, but for purposes of my comments today, I'm going to focus on the Middle East and on Northern Africa. Research from the Pew Foundation confirms what we already know uh, regarding religious freedom in the Middle East, in certain respects, there simply isn't much. Um, Middle East, African, North countries, which are predominantly Muslim, have the least religious freedoms of basically anywhere in the world. Uh, it measures the highest in both government-imposed restrictions and on social restrictions. Now, notwithstanding that, I want to point out that the church has two stakes in the Gulf and three districts in Palestine and in North Africa. Um, so why is Islam viewed so negatively in some respects and in some circles? Uh, I note that in just about every panel that we've had, uh, the issue of Sharia law has been raised in one respect or another. Um, I appreciated Judge Wallace's comments when he was talking about helping the judiciary when he said, you need to start with uh, setting aside the crazies on the one hand. Uh, what was he referring to? There are the atrocities carried out in the name of God by the Islamic State, or, or formerly ISIS. What is the Islamic State? Well, it is extremists. In our vernacular, we might use the phrase fundamentalist. Um, while it is a crude analogy, the Islamic State to Islam is what the Tom Greens and the Warren Jeffs, or maybe more appropriately, the Singers and Swaps and the Lafferty Brothers are to Mormonism. It can be incredibly frustrating to have your faith full of law-abiding and peace-loving people and families hijacked and viewed through such a perspective. Remember, we're talking about 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. And the Islamic State and those extremist views make up a very small uh, portion of that population. Unfortunately, when the extremists converge and descend into a void uh, and succeed in recruiting, then minority faiths tend to suffer at their hands and I'm referring to the, the, Yaz the Yazidis and the Christians in Iraq and Syria and the Coptics in Egypt and so forth. Um, I also would like to note that Latter-day Saint Charities has responded quickly to try and help alleviate human suffering in the region and it's been my privilege to uh, observe that and assist. Uh, it is an agile organization that has responded quickly and it's an honor to be a part of it. Now moving on from extremism um, you'll be surprised perhaps to learn that Tunisia and Algeria, for example, for a long time have had laws and protections in their constitution that allow and protect conversion to any faith. But the reality is that in practice they still impose Sharia law that forbids apostasy. So there's uh, a conflict in the law. Uh, apostasy therefore is often addressed through social or family means or by in some instances ignoring elements of the law and of the Constitution. With the Arab Spring, many national constitutions have been rewritten. And it's been my privilege to be able to review several of those constitutions. You see in them a statement to the effect that X country is an Islamic country and Islam is the state religion. It then says, as taken from international conventions and as articulated by uh, Professor Sharifs, uh, freedom of belief, freedom of religious practice is protected. Now, belief cannot be compelled as we know, but in practice when acting upon one's belief demonstrates apostasy, there are both social and legal consequences in an Islamic country. So if Sharia law says one thing and the Constitution says another, the question is which will prevail? 
We took a look at Article 18 of the UDHR and Article 18 of the UCCPR today, and it reminds me of a statement. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. But removing attempts in the region to seek to change or convert Muslims, um, and you find that much of the region allows for significant freedoms of individual worship. In many uh, of the Gulf states, uh, viewed on a continuum, you find that religious freedom uh, in a limited scope of worshiping your own faith tradition has expanded and is more openly allowed than it has been in the past and is actually protected. Uh, many of these uh, Muslim countries participate in discussions about religious freedom. Most Muslim countries are vocal in saying you're free to come, to believe and to worship, to live in peace among us and to work in our country, but please leave your evangelizing, particularly to Muslims, at the door. In the Gulf states, expats for a long time have met and worshipped together in small groups, in their homes or in villas. Um, but what is happening is these uh, groups of expats are growing and larger numbers of, of members of similar faiths desire to worship together. Uh, many of these Muslim states, and in particular in the Gulf states, have recognized a need to uh, put a legal framework in place for religious communities. They've passed legislation that allows the creation of these religious communities. With such rec recognition, these communities are allowed to buy or lease worship facilities, to set up bank accounts, to get utilities, and this time of year, air conditioning in the Middle East is essential. Um, with each of these, um, uh, with that recognition, these uh, faith groups are able to uh, support one another. Uh, similar to Rick Page's comments on uh, the limitations that are in place, uh, many faith groups face in the Middle East until they're able to become these religious communities. But often there are regulations that are passed along with these new laws that put in limitations like your faith tradition must first be approved by state security, which often is a dead end. Or you must first have a certain number of local members uh, before they will give you that recognition, which has uh, created a problem. In closing, Islam is at a critical moment in its history. Many of its leaders realize that uh, to overcome global Islamophobia, um, they need to do something. Um, they, I've heard dialogue about that they can't risk continuing to do nothing. They're saying if you knew who we really are and what we stand for, you would see us and our position very differently. And doesn't that sound familiar? I would like to share a short video of a portion of King Abdullah II of Jordan's speech to the European Parliament in Strasbourg in March of this year. And I would like you to uh, invite you to listen to try and see the world through a Muslim's eyes. How do I get off this? It's just, it's on the page. Right there. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said, None of you has faith until you love for your neighbor what you love for yourself. This is what it means to be a Muslim. Among the very names of God we hear, the compassionate, the all merciful. All my life, every day, I have heard and used the greetings Assalamu Alaikum. I wish for the other to be blessed with peace. This is what it means to be a Muslim. More than a thousand years ago before the Geneva Conventions, Muslim soldiers were ordered not to kill a child, a woman, or an old person. Not to destroy a tree, not to harm a priest, not to destroy a church. These are the same values of Islam we were taught in school as children. Not to destroy or desecrate a place where God is worshipped. Not a mosque, not a church, not a synagogue. This
this is what it means to be a Muslim. These are the values I teach my children and they will hand it on to theirs. Good afternoon. <clears throat> it's a privilege for me to be here. My name is Scott Isaacson. Um, I currently work at the law firm of Curt and McConkie. Uh, for 17 years now, I've been associated working with the Office of General Counsel. I was an area legal counsel in South America and in the Caribbean. And uh, I'm privileged to share the podium with these uh, colleagues. Um, I've been asked to talk about Latin America. And it, it's interesting listening to this because Latin America is, is unique. Most of the other reports have been dealing with areas where the church is in, in the frontier stage. The church is just trying to gain recognition, trying to gain a presence in the country. In all, all of Latin America outside of Cuba, which is the last frontier for those of us Latin Americans, um, the church has been there for many years now. We're third or fourth generation members. We have temples in all of the countries, at least one. Uh, the major countries, some of the very small ones we don't yet. But um, it's in a different stage. So what are, are there legal issues there for us, for the church? And I wanted to introduce the topic by pointing out something as I put up here on the slide. In the last 50 years or so, there's been a massive social change in Latin America, a historic change. The, the, the region went from nearly 100% Catholic to a plurality of religions. Um, now this is from the Pew Institute, you can see on the, on the slide there. Um, looking as recently as 1970, 92% of the people in Latin America were Catholic. And in 2014 that was down to 69%. I think Bill slipped out, but I was going to make a comment that Bill and I served our missions in Latin America in the early 70s. I don't know if that's a coincidence, if that had any influence in this change. Um, I served in Central America, Bill served in, in the Andes countries in Bolivia and, and that area. Um, this next slide shows uh, by country, and I hope you can read some of those numbers. They're actually quite remarkable. If you look, for example, um, at, under the 2000, notice that there was very little change between 1910 and 1970 in those countries. But then between 1970 and 2014, we see dramatic increases in the membership in non-Catholic religions to the extent that in Central America in several countries it's now less than 50 percent of the population are Catholics. Um, now the largest uh, non-Catholic churches that have grown in that last in the 40 years unfortunately has not been the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints so I guess I have to take back what I said about Bill and me and our missionary efforts it's been the evangelical churches that have grown and, and, and become, uh, in some countries, a significant political influence. So with that little background about this change in, in the last 40 years or so, what does that mean for us and for the church? What are some of the, some of the uh, legal issues? Now, non-Catholic churches have for some time, at least since World War II, when, when, the, when the, the Catholic church gradually ceased to be the official state church of, of, those, of that part of the world. Um, other churches have been free to do basically what they need to do. We've been able to send our missionaries, and there's occasional challenges here and there, but generally speaking, we can send our missionaries, we can own land, we can build temples. We can do what we need to do. So um, that's wonderful. However, because the Catholic Church exist, existed before the nations of Latin America existed, the Catholic Church exists in a unique legal situation. It is an independent sovereign. It, it, it exists independent of the state, and, and it um, is governed by its own canon law. It, it uh, pretty much does whatever it needs to do without any permission or, or, or uh, restriction from the state. And that worked fine, but as the other churches um, grew, they, we found that there was a lack of appropriate 
uh, laws, I think I skipped a slide there, a lack of appropriate laws and regulations to meet the needs of non-Catholic religions. Um, we were able, in most countries, to find ways to do what we needed to do, but it was less than ideal. There were very, we had to form legal entities that didn't really correspond with the kind of legal entity that, or the kind of entity that the church is. And in other ways, we've had to kind of patch together how we function in these countries. And so there's been a movement in the last 20 or 30 years to the ad adopting of new religion laws. Uh, laws have been adopted in some of the major countries, such as Chile, uh, Colombia, uh, Peru adopted a law a few years ago. Um, some of these are, and, and some of them are quite well done. There have been some, some good thought. Others have some faults. Um, you know, the, the one in Peru recently, although we, uh, the, our, this, the BYU Center actually played a role in helping to get that law uh, rolling many years ago. When it eventually got adopted, they put in some restrictions that have meant that basically no church has been able to register under the law. Not a single church has been able to qualify, uh, which kind of defeats the purpose of having a law. Although it had some good intentions and it has a lot of good things in it, it didn't work very well. Um, so we're in the process right now, we're seeing more and more laws come forward um, to meet the needs of religious and organizations. Uh, some appropriate laws have been adopted and others are considering laws. Right now, we've been in the process in the last year of reviewing and submitting comments on law proposed laws in, in Costa Rica, in Honduras, Bolivia, uh, and the Dominican Republic. Um, now, there's still a disparate treatment. We need to understand this. Between The Catholic Church still enjoys privileges that the other churches don't do. But what I'm pointing out is that we can, we can do the basic things we need to do. And, and some, the evangelicals in particular are distressed by this disparity, that the Catholic Church has these certain privileges that other churches don't. And so, um, the, especially in some countries, the evangelicals have formed political parties and have gotten part, people elected. And they have been and are proposing laws that, that in some sense try to attack the Catholic Church, and those laws have never succeeded anywhere. I think that's a waste of energy. We should find a way to raise the other churches up and not attack the Catholic Church. But uh, the other thing that I've noticed, an unfortunate tendency, Cole mentioned this in his introductory remarks, that groups that were once persecuted when they obtained some power turn around and sometimes tend to, to persecute uh, other groups. And unfortunately, we're seeing that, that tendency from the evangelicals. Several of the laws they're proposing are making it more challenging for new religious organizations to get recognition in the country. Now that they're in power, they're, they're raising barriers to entry to newer churches. Now that doesn't hurt us. In, in, in the LDS church, we've been in all those countries for years, but we're still doing what we can to try to educate and explain that that is not in, consistent with the international norms of religious liberty, and we should not be doing those kinds of things. Um, we should be uh, in favor of laws that would respect the religious rights of everyone. Um, let me move on to another. Another challenge that we see uh, that we've had to deal with in the, in the last few years have been leftist governments being formed in, in certain countries. Venezuela, Bolivia come to mind. Um, we've had to take our foreign missionaries out. They, they have, in some of those countries, at times, um, it's consider foreign missionaries are seen as a form of neo-colonialism in some of those countries, and it's a serious concern. Um, another example, which I, I could el elaborate on, but when I was area legal counsel in the in the Caribbean, we suddenly had uh, I got this a phone call, which you would hope you would never get, from our local council in Guyana, saying all of your missionaries are being arrested. We had about 60 missionaries in the country. And they had arrested a, this, a senior couple that was there. And our attorney, who wasn't a member of the church, but a very good attorney, you know, called and said, you know, what can we do? And we said, well, please negotiate. Let's talk to them. We persuaded them not to go around and arrest all the missionaries in their apartments that night. We said they'll voluntarily turn themselves in uh, the next morning. And so they did. The missionaries came in and turned themselves in, and they were put in jail. The government was claiming that they had improper visas, and they didn't. It's a long story, but they were there. We don't do that kind of thing. They, they had proper visas. Um, during the day, we were able to get an injunction from the Supreme Court off telling 
the, the police chief who was holding the missionaries, oh, by the way, the missionaries are loving this. I mean, they're singing songs and they're, you know, they're, they're imprisoned for the gospel. And, and uh, of course, mom and dad don't feel quite as happy about it back home. You can imagine that was a pretty tense day for me as area legal counsel. Um, we eventually, this may sound odd, well anyway, we got, an, we got an order ordering that the missionaries be released and the man who was holding him said, I don't care, threw it away. It was, that goes to Justice Wallace. That was the Supreme Court ordered them to release the missionaries because they were there legally, but they said, we don't care. We, we got, later in the day, we actually got an appointment with the president of the country and I, I think that sounds crazy, but remember Guyana is a little tiny country, but it hit, this whole episode hit CNN News and so I think they were embarrassed that you know, more, all Mormons arrested in this country. And the, we said the people that were there, our attorney and, our, and the senior couple who was representing us um, there, so why did you do this? Why did you, why did you arrest our mission? What's the problem? And he said, well, the other churches are complaining you have too many missionaries, and so we, we want to set a quota on you, 20 mission instead of 60 you can have 20, which is completely arbitrary. You know, rule of law is pretty weak in those kinds of countries. Well, the point I wanted to make is we, we have challenges, but, and we have chal we had challenges in Venezuela and other countries, but th this is the point I wanted to make. Well, what did, how did the church respond? Well, we, we honored the quota, of course. They told us, you know, they let the missionaries out of jail that day, and, and, but they, all ha they had to leave, and we got a new quota of 20. But the area presidency took it as a challenge, and they went to the saints in Guyana, and they said, we can only get 20 missionaries here. We need you to step up and prepare your young people to serve missions. And within a short time, the, the missionary quote, uh, the number was back where it was. And the similar things have happened when we've lost the opportunity to send foreign missionaries in to Venezuela and some, Bolivia and some of the other countries. We haven't closed the missions because the church is at a point where it can fill its own needs. Um, moving on, I, I'm out of time. The, uh, just a survey of some of the other issues. In spite of the, of the influence of the Catholic Church, the LB. LGBT agenda is advancing in many countries in Latin America, and I don't, we've said a lot about that at this conference. I won't spend more time on that. Let me just conclude to, to point out something that I think is worth mentioning. Um, we see a lot of conflict about religion. We've, we've, we've had reviews of it here from, from the survey of the world. But think about that massive social change that I mentioned at the beginning. We have seen a peaceful transformation where a church that was once the state church and, and the, the, the vast majority of the members belong to that church. And we've seen this transformation where now there's a plurality of religions. And I think that we need to, in some ways, uh, we need to be grateful to the Catholic Church and the Vatican too and, the, and, the, and some of those uh, teachings that they've done to allow this transformation to happen in a peaceful uh, example. In some ways, Latin America stands out as an example for the rest of the world. Thank you. It's a real honor to be here with you today, and it's been a privilege to be here for the last couple of days, uh, taking in the things that have been presented by the other uh, people who have prepared so well to teach us so expertly. And uh, I'm very grateful for the colleagues of mine that have gone ahead and have spoken so eloquently on the areas in which they work. Um, just to put it in context, my name is Neville Rocco. Um, I'm from Australia, and uh, I'm here really in transit um, with my wife, uh, Penny. She and I are on our way to uh, Brussels to serve a, a mission as government, government relation missionaries uh, in the European Union. So uh, uh, don't, don't think we don't know anything about Australian law. We know a little bit about it and we'll be talking about that today. But just to just to give you an idea of how microscopic the work that I'll be doing today is compared with my assignment, um, I've been assigned the Pacific area which goes all the way from Japan down to Antarctica, all the way from the coast of Australia to the coast of the United States and South America. Um, I'm going to be talking about principally two countries, Australia and New Zealand, because um, I think you should stay with the things you know something about. Uh, 
So what I, what I want to do today is try and keep this as brief as possible, is to uh, talk about threats and opportunities in the area of freedom of religion. Um, now, these are nuanced questions. They're complex. Um, they can't really be done complete justice to in just the few minutes we have here together today. But in broad, the, the challenges in each of the two countries that I'm talking about are slightly different. Uh, New Zealand is a very religious country uh, in many respects because of the influence of islander people who live there and uh, it has had a temple since the 1950s, uh, an LDS temple has been there since the 1950s and uh, it has a very strong LDS culture that is very well recognised within the country. Um, looking in contrast to Australia, Australia now has temples in all of its major uh, cities but that's a very recent development. It's only been in the last uh, 20 years that they've come. And uh, the LDS population in Australia probably represents some fraction of 1%. So we're talking about two countries that are different in their religiosity. The general tendency of Australians, I, I would say, is probably very secularist, very laissez-faire regarding religion. And most people wouldn't really care about the question of freedom of religion very much. And um, Although I'll be talking about threats, and I'll only be choosing a couple of them to speak about today, there are several threats to religious freedom in Australia and New Zealand. They include terrorism, um, and it seems that every time there's a threat of terrorism, that is used as, as either a reason or a pretext for there to be a closing down of some areas of religious freedom, particularly if those terrorists are in some way religiously motivated. And I can tell you that uh, in the jurisprudence of Australia, wherever there's a conflict between, uh, between religious freedom and uh, national security, with very few exceptions, national security comes out on top. Um, so I'll be talking about that, leaving out things like uh, planning regulations and uh, uh, restricted interpretations of the Constitution. All those things uh, can be left to one side just to talk about a few things, but I also want to talk about a few opportunities that have come up. Again, only a very limited band of those. <clears throat> um, in terms of threats, there are a few that I think exist. First of all, there is a general one that I want to talk about uh, very briefly, and that is that with the increased secularism of society and government institutions, including the courts, Religion is being uh, reduced down in importance and indeed there are a number of threats to religious freedom that are both direct and indirect. In the indirect sense, there is an attack upon the tax deductibility of donations and uh, the uh, exemptions from land tax and the like uh, in Australia. And that's also on the agenda uh, to some extent in New Zealand. Um, also, there is the constant discussion about LGBT rights, how they impact upon uh, religious freedom. And I've had the privilege uh, over the last several years to appear before um, several federal and state uh, 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 commissions that have been inquiring into this. And so far in Australia, it has not legislated for um, religious freedom, in fact, uh, sorry, for uh, LGBT marriage, for same sex marriage. And in fact, a couple of years ago, it went before our equivalent of the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said it was a uh, democratic issue. The court ought not to deal with it and uh, threw the case out. So we stand in a slightly different position both from the United States and also from New Zealand where New Zealand has actually introduced same-sex marriage without a great deal of democratic uh, <coughs> consultation. Um, the second threat is a little more specific and I just want to talk about that a little bit and that is the influence of anti-discrimination legislation. Um, virtually every piece of anti-discrimination legislation, both in Australia and New Zealand, grants to some extent an exemption for religious bodies or people with religious views, and so that people of religious conscience can be protect protected in various ways from what otherwise would be liability for discriminatory conduct. What is starting to happen now, having had that type of legislation now for 20 or 30 years, is there is emerging a tendency in the courts where some courts are narrowing down those restrictions and reading them very narrowly. Other courts are giving them a wide interpretation and religion comes out on top. 
and there have been two quite uh, famous cases that have been decided in the last few years, one in New South Wales in the Court of Appeal, where <coughs> the Wesley Mission uh, was able to succeed in maintaining its policy of, uh, of adoption that was selective to make sure that children got the best uh, parents they could possibly get and excluding LGBT applicants, they, they were able to succeed on that. Uh, whereas in Victoria recently, the Christian Brethren Church was unsuccessful in a case where they refused to uh, hire out one of their campsites to a, uh, an LGBT youth group. Um, so at the moment that seems to be the thing that is the major threat and it's really a wait and see uh, matter, but I think as uh, secularism increases to have its grip upon the minds of judges, we can see that as being uh, an increased area of threat. Now just to turn to a, uh, one phenomenon that needs to be understood. Religion is generally in these statutes treated as an exception rather than a right. And so it is carved out as something for which you are not liable if you can show some sort of religious justification. And so, as I said before, the courts are divided in the ways that they will interpret those, those uh, statutes. <clears throat> now to turn to some opportunities. Um, the first opportunity, I think, is a very general one that we can talk about, and that is that we have uh, in Australia and New Zealand, it seems, what's referred to as the law and religion mafia. Now, um, last year I was speaking at a conference at the Australian National University and the moderator of my session introduced me as a member of the law and religion mafia. Now, I thought as he said that, that sounds like some sort of secret society, and it was so secret that I didn't even know I was a member of it. <laughs> um, so, so but, but we are fortunate that we have a number of people with whom we can uh, work on a number of these issues. We have uh, very high-ranking academics, very uh, well-experienced professionals who are prepared to do donate their time and make themselves available to work on law and religion issues. The second opportunity is a little more specific, and that is one that uh, my wife and I have been involved in over the last 18 months, which we refer to affectionately as the Deloitte study, where we've engaged the accounting firm of Deloitte to work with us on an econometric project to measure the value of religion in Australian and possibly in the future New Zealand society. Now, the, in order to conduct that study, we have empanelled a group of uh, high-ranking religious fish, uh, officials, particularly from the Catholic Church, but also from the Anglican Church and a number of other de denominations, as well as non-Abrahamic uh, faiths. We have also uh, engaged a number of universities to be on a board where we can conduct that study, and we expect by the end of this year to come up with some preliminary uh, studies as to the value of religion in Australia and hopefully eventually in New Zealand. The third opportunity that I want to talk about was we, have, we are very fortunate that we have an openly gay man as one of our human rights commissioners, and that's Tim Wilson. And he has shown himself to be a person who is very open to dialogue. He knows nothing about religion and therefore wants to be educated about it and is particularly interested in being educated about it by our members of the LDS community who seem to him to be quite well informed. And so he's a person who presents himself as being with both an open mind but a lot of power and influence to make changes so that if there are compromises that need to be made, they'll be quite fair ones. And, and uh, the email that was referred to earlier today by Professor Shafts was one where I referred him to the Utah Compromise as something that we might want to discuss. So that, in a nutshell, is where we sit in Australia and New Zealand. And thank you very much for your attention. So we have uh, five or ten minutes left to, for discussion questions. Uh, we'll just take those as any of you would like to ask questions of this group. There's one at the back. 
on your side of the, of the back. Or you've got one here? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm a law student. I'm from Spain, and I study in Paris. My question is for Mr. Jensen. I wanted to know how do you see religious freedom in France? If uh, it's, I don't know if you can tell it's religious freedom because laicite it's not it's not the same. And uh, I wanted to know also what do you think of Spain? I mean, how can we be prepared to to face with religious freedom? Sorry for my English. We're thankful for your English. Your English is excellent. I wish I spoke German like you speak English. Um, good questions, of course. Uh, most of Western Europe has strong traditions of religious liberty principles. Uh, France, of course, has a, a strong separation of, of church and state. Um, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints functions freely and well in France. We have the ability to operate uh, uh, the way we choose. We have missionaries there sharing uh, the gospel according to their tenets freely. A temple is being built and so forth. Of course, uh, it is a little different in France from other uh, countries that also have a strong religious liberty tradition. Um, it's very well known, probably to everyone in this group, uh, the ban on headscarves, which in France, which is uh, done from its uh, religious tradition and its separation of church and state tradition. Um, you know, it, I, I find that a little unfortunate uh, that that uh, happened, but it's the case. Um, in Spain, similarly, there are strong uh, traditions of religious freedom. Obviously, the Catholic Church has a major presence, the strongest presence in Spain. Um, the LDS Church, uh, along with three other confessions, are members or is a member of kind of a second tier of recognition in the country. And it's th that group of uh, religious uh, confessions that have recently been granted by this new bill in Parliament the right for religious ministers in those confessions to conduct marriages with civil effect. Uh, now, uh, obviously, elections are coming up later this year in Spain. Um, th there are populist parties that are challenging the establishment. Um, obviously, with what has happened in Greece, eyes are on Spain. And obviously, other countries, including uh, France, with the populist uh, political uh, movement there of some years. So. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm addressing your question, but as far as the LDS Church is concerned, we operate freely. We have a temple in Spain. Um, uh, however, uh, we'd like to see the same kinds of extensive, more extensive rights available, not just to our church and those in the second tier of recognition, but other groups that would allow, for example, property tax exemption for religious buildings, uh, tax exemption for donations, and so forth, which are things we don't, we have in France, but we don't yet have in Spain. Let's see, I think there was another question up toward the back. Uh, yeah. I wonder if you mobilize the members of the church with respect to these issues to lobby for you in these various countries, or if that's sort of like so uncontrollable because people will say whatever they say that is their way of saying it and not the church's way of saying it perhaps. And I also secondly wonder if this is an area in our religious liberty uh, initiative in the Clark Society that um, lawyers that are members in the various countries could actually help you with on a on a quasi lobbying level. I'm talking about letter writing or or just getting to know people, that sort of thing. I'm not sure who wants to take that one. Uh, that seems like Rick Page ought to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Nothing like having your friends nominate you. <laughs> that actually doesn't seem like Rick Page should answer that one. The the. Uh, the sensitivities in Asia, I think, 
um, and the delicacies of how some things play together, I think would make the area presidency very reluctant to have um, a, an open door on lobbying. Um, and I have to say, I'm not really sure that the lobbying climate is the same in those Asian countries as, as we face in the United States and in Western Europe. We do draw on on uh, members and member lawyers in some countries who have existing relationships with government officials and, and other opinion leaders on a case-by-case -case basis. But as far as a, as a general call to arms, um, I think in Asia, we're not there yet. I don't know about other places. I can add, <clears throat> for Latin America, where there, there have been quite a few laws proposed, one thing that we've learned is that any official lobbying on behalf of the church has to be approved by the first presidency. And so, you know, even at the area levels, they don't just go off and do lobbying. Now, that doesn't mean that members of the church couldn't and shouldn't be very much engaged on their, as private citizens in lobbying and helping in the effort, but they, they need to be careful. The church needs, you know, is very careful about controlling the official. So <clears throat> in some countries where we've had to submit um, official comments from the church on proposed legislation, those go through not really the correlation, but the equivalent of that. I mean, it's, it's approved by the brethren. But we've invited, we've had attorneys in some of those countries on their own draft more, much more detailed and extensive uh, you know, comments and submit them in their own names. So that's certainly available. Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the things that I would just say in response to that is I know in the uh, Clark Society meetings in February, uh, one of the things that was emphasized and things you can do is uh, do not uh, claim that you're speaking for the church. This is clearly uh, it's, it's a very sensitive issue because the, the brethren are very sensitive to their responsibilities in leading, uh, in leading out on religious affairs. Uh, and so, so this is one of the real st struggles. It's clear, and, and you've seen the numerous statements of people, of the church leaders wanting our members to uh, be anxiously engaged, find effective things to do. But you have to understand they're also aware of some countries where some false steps by zealous members set the church back 20 or 30 years. So this is, this is why there is both caution, and there's both a deep recognition of the need, uh, but also caution. Uh, so uh, exercise care. I was just going to make uh, one other quick comment, uh, add, adding to what uh, Cole said, uh, that in actually in some in some countries of the world there are prohibitions on uh, foreign involvement in a local legislative process. Uh, as much as we would like to think that that uh, the church is a worldwide church, and it, and it certainly is, but that's not how we are portrayed uh, uh, out there in in a number of countries. Uh, we are viewed as a North American church, and more specifically, we're viewed as a U.S. church. And so, even though we have a very local face, and we try uh, very hard to have a local face, uh, yet when it comes to um, becoming involved in an official capacity, either, uh, either opposing or being in favor of legislation, uh, that indeed has to be uh, carried on very carefully because, uh, again, in some countries there are legal prohibitions on uh, uh, involvement of uh, forces outside the, the specific country. So I think we could probably take one more. I see a question over here. Or did uh, someone, oh, someone else, back. someone had the microphone over there already. Someone? Okay, go ahead. Yes, my name is Jason uh, Hayward. I'm an attorney from Oregon. My question is uh, directed probably more toward David and Lee. What could you tell us about the uh, landscape, current landscape, with respect to religious freedom in Turkey and how that may or and or does impact the church? That's all yours, Dave. Oh, okay. Um, Turkey has a, a fairly robust uh, constitutional protection, but in reality, Turkey is a country that is 99% Muslim. 
uh, as you know, it has uh, historically had a strong Western leaning, uh, but recently I think outsiders and insiders within Turkey question some of the policies and directions that uh, President Adrosian has, has taken the country. From a political, I mean from a social <coughs> point of view, uh, the church does uh, operate there. We have two, um, we have two uh, branches there, two units. We have one in Istanbul and one in Ankara. Uh, there are missionaries there. They are not referred to as missionaries. They're referred to as volunteers because uh, they represent the worldwide Christian church. Uh, they are not tied to the local legal entity. We do have a local legal entity there that carries out the renting of a facility, et cetera. Uh, but, um, but their presence there currently, at, well, ha effective as of July 1st, is now switched over, but has been through the uh, Sofia Bulgaria mission. Uh, now we through the Central Eurasian mission uh, under President Toronto. I think that... Um, um, as long as we abide by some fairly straightforward rules, uh, these are self-imposed, but we do them because we, we abide by them because they, uh, in the long run, uh, I think that they're in our best interest. Uh, for example, the young volunteers there, uh, they don't wear name tags. They do not proselyte on the street. They do not approach people on the street. Uh, they don't hand out pass along cards. They don't hand out pamphlets. Uh, there's there's so much that uh, we might view uh, as being part of a traditional uh, the, the, a, a traditional missionary experience. Uh, that is really not what is there. But what they can do, they they certainly can meet. Uh, they can speak to people who do approach them. They can uh, distribute. Uh, uh, our, our church materials to those who have approached them. Uh, they can serve, um, and uh, so there's much that they can do. Uh, but again, I would kind of refer to it as a non-traditional mission, so to speak. Um, they can teach. Uh, sacred ceremonies can be performed. Baptisms can be performed and can be performed by foreigners. So they're able to do that uh, also. Uh, so. Um, uh, again, perhaps maybe not traditional, but I think there's much work to be done there. I think a real unknown is, well, what will happen in the, in the Soviet, the former Soviet stands, and, and how will work be carried out there? Um, that, that remains to be seen. By the way, I think I just misspoke. Uh, we were about, we've just had the Olympic 10 given to us. So we've got to, we've got till three. So if there are some additional questions, we have time for that. Yes, up here. Hi, I wanted to um, see if the uh, members are alive and well in Saudi Arabia. We lived there from '94 to '97 in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and there were. Um, Christianity is not allowed in that country, but our church leaders and the Saudi leaders had an understanding that we had very specific rules that we had to follow. We could have 30 members in the house. The men didn't wear ties till they came in. Scriptures were carried in bags. We met on compounds, no proselyting. So we had a branch of about 70. And so, um, Right as we were leaving, I, I heard the rules were, were a little bit loosened, um, that the Saudi was the best kept secret uh, stake in the, in the church, and that maybe some land was bought in Bahrain for temple. Anyway, I just, I'm, I'm, since that was a major part of our lives, I'm wondering now that I have the opportunity to hear what's, what is going on there, and I know there's a you know, ton of conflict with everything going on, and, we even stuck, snuck my daughter uh, 6 a.m. one morning to the Red Sea with another member um, and we baptized her and my husband wore the thobe and so we have some fond memories um, of our Saudi uh, branch members so I'm just wondering what, what is going on there. Yeah, let me, let me start by uh, referring to uh, what's, what's happening in, in Bahrain. Um, we have a, a villa there that is rented and is used for church purposes. No intent for a temple. 
there at all. Okay, I just want that to. Uh, uh, no. Right. Um, and in, in Bahrain, we have a legal status, a legal entity. We are, we are registered there. We are allowed to operate and to lease a building and uh, conduct our religious rites on a low profile basis and in a way that does not uh, offend the faithful. Um, and that's the way that it is, is addressed. In uh, Saudi Arabia itself, they continue to have low profile um, gatherings in villas and in homes. Um, we try to keep the numbers minimized. Um, the local leadership is very careful to pay attention to uh, goings on. Nothing is posted in terms of where meetings are on social media and so forth because it's an, it's an informal status. It's house meetings that they engage in. And, and it's going to stay that way um, out of respect for the laws of Saudi Arabia. I have to tell you, it's very hard to see from down here because of the lights, but... Uh, Oh, there's one at the very back. What can we as ordinary citizens do, if we're not lawyers, um, to protect religious freedoms abroad? Is social media effective? Is it hindering efforts in areas where um, maybe religion is looked down upon or they have different restrictions like you're talking about? Is that a helpful means of using it? This sounds like a question from Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I guess turn, or, uh, turn around or about. about, yeah, turn about is fair play. Um, well, as a general principle, of course, uh, we've been encouraged in this conference to engage in certain specific kinds of acts that are attuned to us individually to help uh, sustain and, and further the cause of, of religious freedom. Um, to, to a certain extent, it may be a little more uh, challenging if, uh, if you're living here in the United States to have a significant impact internationally. But on the other hand, the world is a small place, um, uh, especially when you're talking about social media and other electronic means. I think as, as long as uh, you're acting as an individual and not portraying yourself as a spokesperson for the church. As long as you're prayerful about what you do, as long as you're wise, as long as you're moderate in tone and not shrill about the messages that you send, by all means, um, share uh, messages about the gospel and uh, messages about the importance of religious liberty principles for uh, people of all faiths or no faith. And uh, the world being a small place, uh, who knows but what your impact will go far beyond the borders of the US and reach into other areas where it could be beneficial. Let me, let me just perhaps add to that. One of the ki kinds of things that I know we're conscious of. We're working on a couple of projects that involve, for, well, one, for example, is an encyclopedia for the church state studies of all the countries on earth. Uh, this has given us opportunities to be in contact with some of the experts. We do uh, a major conference in October every fall, bringing people in from around the world. One of the challenges for us is how to find low-key, non-threatening, non-burdensome ways to keep in touch with all the contacts we make. Uh, in effect, we're in touch or have had contact with a substantial percentage of the leadership of the people who run religion policy on earth. Uh, it's hard for us uh, to, to keep, touch, keep in touch with these people. There are often opportunities for that are students who are trying to learn about these areas. Uh, there are ways that people can keep in touch with, in friendly ways, with what's going on. Uh, we tr our headlines a news service depends, of course, on Google and other major news feeds. Uh, but we are off. We welcome uh, 
recommendations from regarding other countries. So, so there are ways, and what, what this does is it creates some low-key ways that one can engage with and befriend uh, people who are uh, influential in shaping religion policy. There may be some practical things that can be done there. I have to say one of our dilemmas is uh, how to manage the store of goodwill and willingness to help uh, given limited resources, but, but that's, that's an area that we're interested in exploring. Uh, yes, over here. I have a question about France. After gay marriage was imposed upon France, I believe through the president or leaders in the government, there were huge demonstrations in Paris. I saw on the news millions of people gathering to um, support traditional marriage and family values. What's the future for those people um, with regard to um, whether they can reverse things so that traditional marriage can be um, the norm again um, in France? And also, does that have good effects for our missionaries and other, other um, churches who uphold traditional marriage still? Okay, well, if I understand the question um, correctly, I'm, I'm not aware of uh, current active efforts in France to revisit the issue of same-sex marriage. Now, obviously, uh, there are large numbers of people in France um, who, who still disagree with the opportunity of same-sex couples to be married. Uh, but I'm just not aware of current efforts to overturn that. And, and in terms of, of missionaries, again, missionaries don't focus on this issue. They shouldn't focus on this, uh, this issue that is the disparity between those who favor and those who oppose uh, same-sex marriage. Instead, they, they focus uh, on a, a Jesus Christ-centered uh, message. Obviously, family and even a, the traditional family is, and an eternal family is part of that message. Um, but I, again, I'm not sure that there's a, a direct connection between what you've described and the success or lack of success of our missionaries. But our missionaries are teaching and baptizing in France. There is substantial interest uh, in the temple uh, being built in France. That's going to be a wonderful uh, new way to advance uh, the gospel message in the country. So things are hopeful and good uh, in France. Let's see. Well, I, I'll take one, one more, and I, uh, even our Olympian 10 is now about to be expired. So take the. Was there some restrictions replaced on the design of the temple in France, some uh, height and so on and so forth? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> okay, um, it's, that's a good question. Um, there, uh, I'm not sure how much you know about the temple design, and I don't pretend to be an expert on it either. Uh, it is in uh, the community close to Versailles. Uh, it's been designed in a way that's hopefully sensitive to the surrounding history and beauty of that part of, of France. Uh, there was a lawsuit that was filed uh, by a local association and three individuals claiming that the temple had not satisfied uh, legal requirements in obtaining its building permit. So maybe that's what you're thinking about. Uh, that's been successfully overcome. Uh, those challengers lost before the administrative tribunal. They have not appealed. So that hurdle is overcome. Okay, please uh, join with me in thanking this panel. And then we'll 
to meet back here at about quarter after, maybe a little after quarter after, because we went over a little bit. Good job, so, all you can do, you just push this in, and there's little buttons right here. You push that one in, you push this one in, and then it just pushes it right to see you. You want to see one of these, brother. Okay. All right. Thank you for being yeah. Yeah, no problem.